Many operators in inverse problems are actually integral operators. So uh, in this second part, we'll look a little bit more closely at function spaces and integral operators. First of all, let me define uh, the LP spaces, which you're probably familiar with, with from uh, other lectures. But anyway, a function in L uh, let, oops, let me do this like this. Yes. Let omega some um, subset of Rn. And, uh, sorry, I'm still fighting with my setup here, but let's see. Uh, let omega, and um, we assume that open, then the LP space on omega is defined as all measurable, fun measurable functions from omega to R with the property that the integral over omega f of x squared to the p, oops, and that's absolute value. Well, let me correct this. Absolute value of f of x taken to the power of p dx is smaller than infinity. And uh, if that's the case, then the p norm of f uh, is defined as the pth root of that number. OK, uh, so uh, the, um, ah, yeah, let me uh, add one thing. Um, I'm always talking about real numbers here. But um, so I'm talking about real numbers. But um, later I will quietly use these all these uh, definitions and all uh, theorems that are defined also for complex numbers. Uh, the reason that's important is that we'll actually do Fourier transforms and then we'll immediately quite naturally go into complex numbers. But um, everything can be extended extremely easy to complex number, easily to uh, complex numbers, but it makes my job much more difficult. So I'm talking about real numbers here and we'll just use everything for complex numbers later. So the uh, most interesting case for us, of course, is uh, L2. So for P equals two, we get L2 of omega, and this is a natural Hilbert space. With uh, the scalar product to functions f and g from L2 of omega, the scalar product is defined as the integral of omega f of x g of x dx. And of course, here it now becomes really important if you take complex numbers or not, because you will have to take the conjugate over there. But let's just forget about this. And of course, the two norm is defined as the square root of the scalar product of f with itself. So this is the same as the integral of omega f of x squared dx. Okay, um, yeah, that's, ah, okay, um, I need to add one thing. Um, you can see that exponent over here, L2, um, that has to be, that's an exponent, so it has to be up there, but uh, when I heard these kind of lectures, that exponent was always the lower index. So I will often forget about this and actually put this in the lower index. Don't, if I write L2 with a lower index, it's exactly the same thing I just forgot. Uh, now every, everybody's putting it up as a true exponent. So uh, um, that's why I'm trying to do it in the same way. Okay, the main equation we have, of course, when, uh, when we have a scalar product is that uh, the absolute value 
of the scalar product of f and g is less or equal to norm f times the norm of g with uh, equality exactly if f and g are linearly dependent. And of course, that's cauchy schwarz Uh, in LP, um, in, in LP spaces, uh, we, rather than that, we use uh, Hölder's equation, which is very similar. And that's smaller than the P norm of F times the Q norm of G with the property that one over P plus one over Q is one, and of course, for p equals q equals two, we get cauchy schwarz back. Okay, um, let me, yeah, for, um, as I said, we'll talk about integral equations. So uh, let me tell you what an integral operator is. And I think this is definition 2.4. Let's take, open set sigma, and that's always assumed to uh, be, um, that's always um, assumed to satisfy the condition up there. So all these um, sets will be open, measurable, right? I won't always write this down. So uh, let sigma, a subset of Rn, omega, subset of Rm, and I write down once, these should be measurable and open, so the LP spaces are defined. Assume that K, the so-called kernel function, is a function that maps from sigma times omega to R, and is also measurable. Then uh, the operator K is defined, and that's the linear integral operator with kernel function K. And that's capital K, and this is a small k. Is defined as in the following way, take, oops, take a function u that maps from omega to r, and uh, that should also be measurable. Take an x in sigma, and then we define, oops, so in sigma, And then we define a function on sigma in the following way, ku of x is defined uh, as the integral um, ah, I'm, I'm getting lost, I'm sorry as the integral of omega k of x and y u of y dy. Now, somehow that's, uh, uh, that takes uh, that operator k, capital K, takes a function from, um, it takes a function on omega and defines a function on sigma. Um, writing this in a slightly different way, this over here is nothing but the L2 scalar product of k of x and dot times u. And uh, this can be quite useful. Uh, for a simple example uh, that will come up very, very often in this lecture, 
that's a convolution. Take, for example, um, sigma equal to omega to be all of Rn. And take a function g that maps from Rn to R. And uh, then if we have k of x and y, defined as g of x minus y, then uh, this is called a convolution. And uh, let me just write down what the exact form is, ku of x, of course, is written as the integral over omega g of x minus y u of k of g of x minus y, u of y dy, and uh, well, that's the typical form that we'll be looking at later. Okay, um, I at this point I didn't ask whether that uh, integral which I wrote down here is in fact defined. So that's not at all clear. Obviously, we'll have to assume something about k and uh, u. And uh, let's make a very specific choice. We have theorem, oops. Theorem 2.5. And uh, we assume the following now. We let sigma and omega be bounded. So they have a finite measure. Um, take a function k that's now defined on L2 of sigma times omega. And uh, I maintain or the theorem says that then the integral operator k that I defined above is an operator that maps L2 of omega to L2 of sigma. So I'm saying that uh, in this case, um, the, uh, the operator um, is, is defined. That's the first thing on L2 of omega. And even KU is in L2 of sigma for all U in L2 of omega. And a little bit more, K is continuous. Okay, so we have to do two things. First, we'll have to show that this is at all um, properly defined. And um, then we'll have to show that it's continuous. Um, I think that's one thing. We can do it all together. Now, uh, let's first look at uh, the one norm of KU. That should be something like the integral now well, let's look at the well, let's look at the following first. Hmm. Integral over omega. Uh, integral over sigma, I'm sorry. Integral over omega. Absolute value of k of x and y. U of y dy dx. Now, um, if this is properly defined, then that means that uh, the inner integral exists for almost all x, and uh, that would mean that our um, that our function um, that our operator is properly defined for almost all 
x, which is not completely clear. Now, um, yeah, this is, you can write this in the following form. Since, um, yeah, we can, uh, we can just apply Cauchy-Schwarz and we get that the, this is the integral over the, the square of this. Let me square this, that makes it easier. Uh, then, oh, excuse me, yeah, the square is equal to the integral over sigma, integral over omega, k square of x and y, dy dx. Since I'm at the square up here, I can leave the square root times integral over sigma, integral over omega, u of y square dy dx. Now, uh, since k is in L2 of sigma times omega, this is exactly the L2 norm of k, and this is in, um, what did I say, sigma times omega, sigma times omega. And this is, now the integral over u of y squared dy exists because we assumed that u is in L2, so this is the L2 norm of u squared, and uh, now this is um, times, and since, since uh, sigma is bounded, I need to multiply here with the size of sigma. So what we get here is that this is definitely smaller than infinity, and it's norm of k times the two norm squared of u times size of sigma. Okay, um, looking at this closely, you find that this is already the one norm of k times u. Right, I mean, this is uh, exactly the one norm, which I defined uh, up there with p equals to one. So uh, we already see that uh, k is an, uh, um, a continuous operator if we take the two norm in um, L2 of uh, omega, if we take the, the two norm on, omega, uh, on, this, on the function space omega, and if we take the one norm on the function space on sigma, right? Okay, so if we equip this, L, this here, oops, excuse me, if we take the two norm here and the one norm here, then it's already continuous. Okay, um, okay, and also, so we find that everything is properly defined. And now we want to do the same thing for the two norm. And the two norm, for the two norm, we have the two norm of KU. And we square it as defined as the integral over sigma integral over omega k of x and y u of y dy squared dx. Now, and uh, again, um, we apply Cauchy-Schwarz, this time in the inner integral. So this is equal to the integral over sigma integral over omega, k of x and y squared dy. And uh, using the same argument as before, this one exists as well. So multiply this with the integral over omega, 
u of y square dy dx. Now, the second part over here, this one does not depend on x, so we can just take it out and we find that this is small or equal to the integral over omega. Are you, that's the norm of u, right? That's the norm of u. Two norm squared times the two norm of k squared. And of course, now we find that, uh, first of all, this is smaller than infinity. So in fact, ku is in L2. And of course, we also see that it's, um, it's this is smaller than a constant times the norm of u. So we have that ku is first of all in L2, and it's also continuous with respect to L2. Okay, so uh, that's a very basic property that we'll make use of quite often. And uh, now I want to go on with uh, some even more basic remarks about operators.